Right, let's just, oh, right, the mic is working. Hi, everyone. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with the dreaded speaker personal anecdote. When I was a child, I dashed my head upon the stones of Armageddon. This is a literal story. Uh, I spent a lot of my childhood uh, on that hill in the northern parts of Israel overlooking the Al Megiddo Plain, which uh, after a lot of centuries of wars and uh, horrific bloodshed, when it became translated into the King James Bible, became known as Armageddon. Here it is, that's what it looks like these days. Here's another way of saying the same thing. This is the same story. Uh, let me tell you about this time I was rushed to hospital during an air raid in Israel. Here's another way of telling the same story. When I was five, I was playing with a friend of mine and I fell over. Yep, all of these things are different versions of the truth and the truth is the way that it is framed. All of these things are true in their own way. In my day job, I'm a consultant, so a lot of my life I spend doing corporate relationship therapy, basically, uh, and, and putting up post-it notes because uh, my agile job is uh, all about bringing forth the, the great consultant uh, wonder that is our Lord and Savior, the agile. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. But the thing about consulting and the thing about actually most therapy is that it's all about different ways of reframing the truth so that people have different kinds of perspectives on it. In a previous life, uh, I did a PhD in mobile phone safety and compliance, so I spent a lot of time uh, in a lab with that kind of very moody lighting. There was actually really terrible lighting there. Um, I mostly didn't have to wear a lab coat. It was really for the photo. Uh, but I did spend a lot of time with that robot, that, that, that robot was a good friend. Uh, and mobile phone safety actually is one of those things that we know a lot about. We've been doing this research since about World War II when uh, radio frequency communication was a thing. And in all that time, uh, the World Health Organization has looked into all of the research and pretty much said, nothing to see here. We don't really have any biological effects, uh, well, any adverse health effects. There are some biological effects, but they're not adverse. Like, there's no, there's no danger from using mobile phones at all in any of the ways that we use them traditionally. <laughs> so mobile phone safety, like climate science and like vaccination, is one of those fields where the science pretty much agrees. But public opinion doesn't necessarily. So it's got this really interesting PR problem. Uh, this would be a really great time for me to pull out a whole heap of hilarious internet arguments about this and show you, but I've already broken my head open once this talk, so we'll just move on. Um, so not everyone thinks that mobile phones are safe or that vaccination is a good thing or that uh, climate change is happening or that it's caused by humans. And the fact that people don't believe it in and of itself is not a big deal. Like disagreeing with a fact is, you know, we do it all the time. Um, what's the problem here is that people who don't believe the evidence and act against it are actually harming a large percentage of the population. So somebody who doesn't vaccinate their own kids is actually putting everyone around them in danger because they're lowering the herd immunity and someone who lobbies against mobile phone towers being put in their neighborhood c creates worse reception for everyone around them. And somebody who writes their password on a post-it note, um, they're blocking the entire organization's ability to do things. Somebody who doesn't show up to stand up, somebody who doesn't comply with the group norms, whether they believe in it or not, whether they agree with them or not, they're causing the entire group to have a lower ability to perform its goals. So, what a group goal is changes over time and people's willingness to go along with it are sort of a matter of public opinion, public opinion within the group. Now this is one way to look at the measurement or uh, establishment of public opinion. This is the Overton window. It was uh, created by Joseph Overton who worked in public policy and really he was talking about the kinds of topics that uh, is acceptable for a politician 
to support publicly in order to get elected or re-elected. So basically, if you want to be in public office, you've really got to go along with what's right in the center of the Overton window, like ideas that are popular and acceptable. Yeah. And that's true for politics in the greater sense of things, but it's also true within a group. People who have ideas and express them that are sort of right at the edges of the Overton window who say like radical or unthinkable things that are considered that within that group tend to be less accepted there. There are ways to move the Overton window. You can make public opinion within your area change uh, and it's how things change over time. It's how we, we got we ended up with the rights to vote by people who aren't rich men. It's how we get pronoun stickers at conferences. It's how government regimes change over time. It's also how we consider it is acceptable to divide humans into groups and what it is acceptable for somebody to say and uh, what it is considered acceptable for treating other people, whether they belong to our group or not and which group we belong to. Now, human brains, they learn by repetition. So the more they hear something, the more true it becomes. And even when we know it's not true necessarily, if, if there's a bit of doubt, it, it, often just hearing it often enough is enough to change people's minds. Um, now, that's a tool you can use. You can, you can use that to make ideas popular or accepted, like, say, facial recognition sign-in is a good thing, and we should do that. That's an idea you could change just by talking about it more. While you're doing that, you're also being influenced by other people's ideas of what's normal and acceptable and ways that are okay to behave. Now, this is an example of that kind of a tool being used. So, uh, Australia has a pretty high uh, uptake of vaccination. But there was a concern for a long time around some areas uh, of people not actually vaccinating their kids enough. And this was an ad campaign that ran in Fremantle, predominantly in Western Australia, that was all about uh, people's, you know, and what we've got here is um, Andrew, who's apparently 33, he's a free local, he uses cloth nappies, eats whole foods, and he immunizes and he's wearing a baby in a bright yellow orange baby sling. And in some groups, that's really weird. But in the group that Andrew spends most of his time in Andrew's community, that kind of behavior is not only normal, but it's acceptable and it's even celebrated. Uh, so this kind of uh, campaign is called identity-based and it appeals to the in-group bias. Basically, people who I consider in my group, the way brains work, uh, kind of goes that we tend to take the opinion of people we identify with, people in our group, more seriously than people who we consider not in our group or strangers. It's just a thing that brains do. Um, this campaign was actually really wildly popular. 59.2% of the individuals that came in contact with this ad involved in this study uh, with no difference between those with alternative and non-alternative lifestyles and we'll just gloss over all the different things that alternative lifestyles might mean, um, felt that the campaign had a positive effect, felt that actually it gave them uh, good feelings and it did increase the rate of vaccine uptake in any ways that anyone can measure it. Um, and what it did was try to make people feel comfortable with the idea that uh, people like us think like this and people like us behave like this. The other thing it did was that um, 16.8% of the people that came in contact with this and participated in the study, on them, they said it had a negative effect. It made them upset uh, every time they came into contact with them, with this ad, any time they saw these kinds of concepts, they became unhappy. Um, and that's, a, that's another thing that happens. When there is a concept or a behavior uh, that we see that we think is unacceptable, uh, that we, you know, that, that doesn't, that people like us don't do, uh, it's a bit triggering, it's a bit, it's a bit uncomfortable, and for some people it's very uncomfortable. Uh, we found that there were very similar things happening, say, with radio frequency protection. Anytime there was anything in the news about mobile phone safety, 
It doesn't matter how much people trusted the source. It doesn't matter how comforting the content was. There was always an uptick in public concern. So that's the thing you can do. Uh, you can make concepts just kind of less upsetting to people or less concerning to people by making them go out of public view. That's one of the ways that say media does things. And the concern dropped when the topics disappear out of news, which means that they disappear out of the conversation. It's not that people stop thinking that mobile phones were evil, uh, but they were less actively worried about it. Now that tool can be used both ways. If you want someone to feel uncomfortable, you can actually actively bring up topics that they're uncomfortable with all the time. And that's things that groups sometimes do. And they cause people to self-select out. Now, changing people's minds about things, th th that, that requires feelings. Like, if we're going to be changing people's minds about anything, they're going to have feelings about it. And feelings are hard. And the facts don't always make a difference. You know, I'm literally a doctor of mobile phones won't give you cancer. And I've had a lot of conversations with people about it, and the facts made no difference. The fact that I was quoting 80 years of research made no difference. That's not what changed people's minds. Change is conflict, and any time you're trying to change people's minds by, say, introducing new security guidelines, you're creating conflict, and you're creating feelings, and actually, humans are mostly terrible at conflict, at you know, resolving it well. And sometimes people aren't great at just handling feelings in general. And there are different cultural ways of resolving conflict. And, uh, you know, it's, or even just asking for things, asking people to do things or not do things. And when I say cultural, I mean appropriate to that group. You know, you, you go to family Christmas, and what's culturally appropriate there is really very different to, say, going to your gaming night. Security is all about telling people what to do and not to do, and it's about pushing boundaries. And people don't like having their boundaries pushed. And uh, a lot of mainstream ways that we interact with each other, say, in, the, in this country, uh, involve not pushing people's boundaries very much. And we're generally taught not to say no. Like, we don't have good ways of saying, mostly don't have really good ways of saying, yeah, um, look, I know what you want me to do, and I don't want to do it anyway. Yeah. We're kind of forcing people to resolve conflict with us when we tell them what to do and what not to do, even when that's our job. And, you know, consent around the ways of behavior is complex at work. But that's still kind of what we're telling people to do and not do. And we're asking them to change, and change is uncomfortable. And we're asking them to do change that they didn't choose like we're forcing security guidelines on them, and they don't want to do that. They're, and people are uncomfortable, they become hostile, and they're resistant. And hostile and resistant looks lots of different ways, but it's often not fun for anyone. So when I'm trying to change people's minds, whether it's about the Agiles or about not writing their password on a post-it note, I'm an, their enemy. Like, changing someone's mind requires, in some way, becoming in conflict. And conflict is often seen as being someone's enemy. And then I become, then I become prey to like, the enemy bias and that everything I say is wrong and I couldn't possibly be right about anything because I am not like them. That's one of the other things that happens when I'm telling people another point of view is that I'm not like them. And the example of Andrew who lives in Frio is a really good way of demonstrating uh, that somebody can belong to a group and also have a slightly different opinion. And that is one of the ways in which the Overton window can move. So let's talk about ways that are capable of changing people's minds. OK, so instead of phrasing things as terrible boundaries, no, you can't do that, yes, you should, no, I'm right and you're wrong, no, this is the way. Um, one of the ways to phrase things is in the positive. For example, let's talk about ways in which we can be free from attack. And that makes people feel comfortable, it makes people feel included, and people are a lot more interested in actually going along with behavior that's considered uh, positive and towards something. 
Becoming part of a group is really important uh, and that means spending time with people and that's sometimes hard and finding ways to identify with people. It also means finding ways for people to identify with me and that means I have to let people get to know me. Like I, I belong to a group sort of to the extent in which I share of myself with the group. And if I'm not sharing anything of myself, I, I'm not really part of the group. I'm, you know, I might be around, I might be in it, but I'm not really part of the group and people can't really identify with me. And people won't listen to me unless I'm part of the group a lot of the time. Everyone has a different definition of what belonging to a group means and who, which groups I belong to and that's always complicated, but as a rule of thumb, it's, I found it not too bad. Another way is to create positive associations with yourself, with your concepts. Um, one of the things I do, and I don't do it for this, but um, I go around to everyone in my team every Friday and I go, what have you done this week that you're proud of? And when they tell me something, and there's always something, they get a sticker. <laughs> it's magical. I can't tell you how magical like this whole thing is. And it's been a really brilliant project management tool for me, and that's not why I do it, but it does also tend to create a positive association with, you know, with just me and the concepts that I have. Another way to do that is to find an advocate for your cause within the group. So like Andrew, who lives in Frio, he's uh, an established group member, like he clearly looks, behaves, and has similar views to other people in the group that he lives in, in, in his area. And if he's advocating vaccination, then that's maybe something I should consider. So there's ways to do that and ways not to do that. Like for example, I don't know if you've ever been in a workplace where, or like in a team that tried to remind people to lock their computers when they step away from them and you do it by, I don't know, making their computer send a slightly ridiculous email or turning their display upside down. <laughs> not that anyone would do that, of course. <laughs> Look, it doesn't work if the security enforcement person does it. But if the person you work with day to day does it to you, you know, like they're your mate, you already know them, it has the intended effect of uh, reminding people not to leave their computers unlocked and doesn't damage the relationship, you know, unless it's done really maliciously. What else works is having like one-on-one, -on -one, having group conversations. Uh, the times I have managed to change people's minds about either vaccination or climate change sometimes or mobile phone safety, uh, was you know when people asked uh, on, or when we were just having little group conversations and people got to actually talk about it. And telling people what to think and, and what I say, like it's really fraught. And what I found is like I came across this rule and I really like it, where, you know, when I'm trying to tell people something that they don't already know or something that I think, you know, when I'm talking with people, I need to, choose at least two of these things. The thing I'm saying needs to be at least two of true and kind and useful. Like what is the best possible outcome of me telling this person this thing? Even if it's true, even if it's kind, eh, they're just gonna hate me. Maybe I shouldn't say it. And sometimes it's about degrees of being right. Like if somebody's sort of coming towards a point of view that I, you know, that, that I want them to have, like say, uh, don't write your post-it note, your, your password on post-it notes and leave it on your monitor, because that's terrible. Like, if I want people to move away from that kind of behavior, um, and they're starting to come to this point of view, like, I don't need to be 100% right, I don't need to correct them when they're moving towards it. Like, it's, there's much higher value in me letting this person be somewhat right and move a little from where they are, rather than correcting them and demanding that they be 100% right now, uh, and in doing so, making sure that they never want to talk to me again. That's less useful in the long term. Asking open questions, like everyone's a local expert, like why do you do this? Why are you writing your password in a post-it note? Like actually just asking people why they think what they do and what associations they have with stuff and why they behave the ways that they do and actually listening. Uh, like they might tell you, I do this because four different people use this laptop and there's not, nothing much we can do about that because various constraints. Because people will only do things that make sense to them. I know that sounds stupid, but 
like actually working backwards and going, well, why is this person doing this? In, in, in what kind of framing does this behavior make sense to someone? In what kind of framing does that behavior make sense to that person? Because people solve the problems that they have, not, not, not the problems that I think are their problems. They solve the problems that they've got. And if I want someone else to solve a problem that I've got, like, say, keeping their laptop uh, unsecured, I need to make it their problem. They're only going to solve a problem that they've got. So I need to either make them believe that this is a problem that they've got, I need to reframe that for them, or I need to like, find some other way in which they have a problem if they don't do that. So there's positive ways, you know, like uh, people prioritizing their own pain so they solve it. So for example, saying, if you pay this invoice on time, you, you can have a 10% discount. Um, or, you know, there's negative ways, like, like enforcing consequences, negative consequences. Now that works both ways. When people do things that I don't want them to do, when people treat their data insecurely, when people leave their laptops on the train a lot and make their data available to anyone and everyone, they turn the solution into my problem. Like it's now my, my problem to solve. Because if I want this problem solved and it's my responsibility to think about it, I'm gonna to have to find a way to fix it because they're not. So, you know, if people are continuously leaving their work devices on the train, yeah, you know, we, we've found ways to fix it because we realized that that was something that users weren't going to fix themselves. So we found ways to like wipe and destroy hard disks remotely. So tech problems, security problems, they're mostly human problems. You know, like creating encryption algorithms. Yeah, they're hard problems. Absolutely, picking useful passwords thinking that passwords are a useful way to interact with the world. Though, you know, the, the, picking useful passwords, that's a technical problem. Thinking that passwords are a useful thing, are a useful tool, that's a social problem, that's a human problem. So if I want to set up PGP, yeah, it's, it's a hard technical problem, but it's nowhere near as hard as actually getting people to use it. Yep. Because technology hasn't solved the fighting in Israel that's been, well, in what's now called Israel, in the Har Megiddo Valley that's been there for thousands of years, and there's been thousands of years of bloodshed around it. And this isn't a technical problem, and technology hasn't solved it. It's a human problem. It's a group problem. And unless you never want to deal with anyone ever again, which, legit, uh, you're probably going to have to deal with humans and you're going to have to deal with groups, and which sometimes means needing to manipulate other people to get your way in the same way that everyone manipulates you. We're all manipulating each other. That's okay. This is how we interact with each other. Now, humans will always subvert to technology to solve the problem they've got and to get what they want because if it doesn't solve their problems, they'll find a way around it, whatever technology. We've all seen this. But as people who work in security, like we've, all, you know, we've either chosen or had given to us the responsibility of looking after other people's problems in ways that they don't think are their problems. Fun, that's a fun game, yeah. So when it's your job to look after a group's problems, one of the, the valuable things that it's probably important to do really early is decide if this is a group that you want to be part of and you want to protect you want to look after their problems. And it's also sometimes the only, you're sometimes the only person that can demonstrate to the group that you're part of it and that you are solving their problems. And that's a question of reframing. And the truth of what the problem is, sometimes that's up to you. Thank you.